Greetings and welcome to the Women's Wellness Facts and Myths on Fibroids event. It's in collaboration with the Fibroid Foundation and the Queens Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta's Health Task Force. And they are chaired by Michelle Soans and Angela Williams. I'm Charmaine Jenkins. I will be your host for today. This will be an informative time together filled with all kinds of takeaways, as many as we can fit in this short time together. And we really hope that this helps you to help yourself as it concerns your uterine health. We have an amazing agenda for today. We will hear from the president of our chapter. We will hear from the founder of the Fibroid Foundation, Sateria Venable. We have two outstanding speakers from Columbia Medical Center, Dr. Jenny Kim and Dr. Rachel, excuse me, McConnell, and the Honorable Yvette Clark, the representative of the Nice District of New York in Congress. We will also have a Q&A session from the med with some medical experts, followed by two excellent breakout sessions, one with Isis Thomas on Yanni steaming. I've heard a lot about that. That's got to be great. And we also have Kala Brooms with the Environmental Working Group presenting on healthy decisions around your personal care products. And also, at the end of our session today, we would like every participant to help us shape future programming by completing a really brief survey. The survey is completely anonymous, but we would like to gather some basic information from our participants today on the impact of fibroids and related health concerns that you or your family might have. The link in the survey will be in the chat for your convenience. And something I'm really excited about is that in honor of our chapter 70th anniversary, we will be sending prizes to the first, the 19th, the 51st and the 70th registrants of this event who also attended and complete the survey. And this is in honor of our 70th anniversary and being founded in 1951. So it'll be the first, the 19th, the 51st for 1951 and the 70th for our 70th chapter anniversary. There's a, just a few points I have to make before we start that I think are essential. First is that the content shared today is for informational and educational purposes only and does not substitute professional medical advice or consultations with your healthcare providers. Also, the chat is a tool to ask questions to the presenters and the moderators. So we want to answer as many questions as possible. So we ask that you please minimize personal conversations with the aim of really trying to create a safe environment for all participants. We ask you to keep our chat friendly and professional. Okay, and I'm gonna thank you in advance for that. And lastly, if you care to share about this event, and we hope you do, we have a few hashtags and I'm hoping somebody can put them in the chat because we have five of them. The first one is hashtag cure for fibroids. The second one is quack and fibroid foundation. The two organizations that collaborated quack for our visitors are is spelled Q U A C. And that's for Queens Alumni Chapter. So it's Quack and Fibroid Foundation. And then we have hashtag Fibroid Foundation. We have hashtag Quack Fights Fibroids. And we have hashtag DST Quack. I know it's a lot. So hopefully somebody caught it. They'll put it in the chat for us. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce the president of Queens Alumni's chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Mrs. Sherelle Hassel Gilbert. Gilbert. Thank you so much, Ms. Charmaine Jenkins. 
My name, as she was just stated, is Sherelle Hassel Gilbert, and I am the president of the Queens Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. As an organization, predominantly African American uh, woman founded over 108 years ago, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority is uniquely positioned to impact not only the well being of its membership, but also the families and communities we serve. To facilitate this if effort, the Health Task Force was launched to provide concentrated expertise and focus on the physical and mental health aspect of our five point program thrust. The of the health task force is to educate and facilitate change for the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of our members and the communities that we serve. The health task force objectives are to raise awareness about benefits of lifestyle changes that affect longevity, morbidity, and mortality. Identify organizational alliances for the sorority that will work to address pertinent health issues and to develop and implement health focused programs with the sorority and the communities. It's but the Queens Alumni Chapter is excited to bring you today's program in partnership with the Fibroid Foundation. Two years ago, our Health Task Force Committee, chaired by Michelle Soames and Andrew Williams, embark on a partnership with the fibroid foundation after seeing firsthand that the uterine fibroids have a disproportionate impact on african americans so on behalf of 16 members of the queens alumni chapter of delta sigma theta sorority incorporated we welcome you to this women's wellness symposium to learn about the health fibroids i now have the pleasure to introduce sataria venable the founder and Fibroid Foundation, a global advocacy organization. The Fibroid Foundation developed support its community of over 25,000 women. Sataria began, Sataria, excuse me, to see efforts in 2007. Since that time, the organization has developed a substantial network within the medical community. Venable, who holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University, has co-authored several scientific papers on fibroid research. She is the inventor of an undergarment inspired by her journey that she hopes to will transform intimate apparel for all women. She is also a sought after speaker, featured in print and radio and radio media, presented a Ganya college conferences worldwide. And at this time, I have the pleasure of turning the program over to Sataria Venable. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Women's Wellness 2021. I'm Sataria Venable, founder and CEO of the Fibroid Foundation. I'm so glad that you have all joined us today. It is truly an honor to share this day of information with you. We hope that you will find the fibroid information incredibly helpful and the wellness information is something that we all are looking forward to as well. I thought I'd start by giving a background of our organization and telling you a little bit about my story that led us here. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, start here. Um, we actually began 14 years ago um, with me advocating. I started the Fibroid Foundation between my second of four, between the surgeries two and three of four surgeries that I had. And I really uh, was on a fact-finding mission um, and was very frustrated as a patient and was living in a major city, but yet unable to find the care that I needed. So I started looking at the statistics, which really blew me away, which I'm sure many of you have had the same reaction. And I started talking with other women and the power of our community is what really um, encouraged me to move forward with trying to find more solutions and establishing a nonprofit. Um, so 14 years later, we are 25 chapters strong um, we have a community of about 29,000 and growing, which is mind blowing to me. And we're based in the Washington DC area. 
Uh, this photo that you see here is from a planning meeting with our New York City ambassadors um, back when we could jump on a train and travel and meet in a restaurant in person. And so hopefully we will return to those days very soon. Uh, I think that uh, my fibroid journey probably is something that will resonate with many of you. Um, I had a really bad surgical experience on surgery one um, because the physician was not really trained in uh, min minimally invasive gynecologic surgery um, as the physicians that you will hear from today will be. And so I was hesitant to seek another um, surgical option. And during that time of hesitancy, I started to feel much worse and my fibroid symptoms worsened as well. Um, so what I learned from that is, one, research your physicians very carefully. Um, two, try to address your symptoms and have them monitored sooner rather than later. Um, when you address them early, you have more options. And uh, that is something that I wish for all of you. So I just wanted to share a little bit about our organization. Um, we have a Fibro Talk series. This is the virtual version of that. Um, the top photo is from Fibro Talk New York City in 2018. Um, and we developed the Fibro Talk series to give patients an opportunity to interface with physicians outside of the clinical setting. So it's more casual. We try to incorporate some fun um, and give everyone an opportunity to have a banter, which is so important because the physicians learn from us and we can learn from them and we can ask lots of questions and oftentimes an office visit doesn't allow for that level of interaction. Uh, so we focus on patient education, which is one of our top uh, mission uh, goals, because oftentimes it's hard to find out uh, how to treat yourself. And I know for me, when I was diagnosed with fibroids, I'd never heard the word. Um, and I had to do a lot of research. And so I empathize with those of you who are finding out about fibroids at the time of diagnosis and are struggling to understand a new diagnosis and to select a treatment option. So we are here to support you in that process and hopefully help you to easily access information to make decisions where that's concerned. Another area of uh, our advocacy efforts is in legislation. And the Fibroid Research and Education Act is coming up soon. Um, we have the pleasure of uh, Congresswoman Clark speaking about that very shortly, um, but we will all need you in that effort um, because our legislators uh, are encouraged by knowing that there are folks in their district who will be um, positively impacted by the legislation that they endorse. And so we will be hosting a letter writing campaign when um, the bill is reintroduced and that will be very, very soon. Um, we also host chapter meetups uh, out of our, our chapters and locations across the country. And in July, we are going to really focus on chapters and patient stories and um, elevating uh, other voices. Um, and we do fun activities like yoga, as you see here in our chapter meetups and other um, wellness modalities that really support you and your body. Um, we also promote a lot of self-care, which is so important. Um, I think last year with the pandemic, uh, we all had just an additional stresses. And so it's really important for us all to take care of ourselves. And um, we are here to support you in that as well. So one of the most important messages that we communicate is that it's it's really important to change the narrative. Um, I've learned that um, I'm the expert in my own body. And it was really empowering um, for me. I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, we started a research effort. We design research studies um, in some instances and provide the patient perspective. And I had 
prepared for this research effort. We submitted the grant and at the first meeting, it was me and 16 physicians. And that was intimidating at first, but I, I thought to myself, you know, I'm here to hopefully be a voice for many women who are suffering. And um, I know my own body and my own experience. And it turned out that fortunately I was right in that and that the information that I've found that I've been able to share um, has opened up a new narrative with our um, clinicians and physicians in the community. And so I encourage you all to share your stories and to stand confidently in your experience because you're helping yourself and you, you may be helping someone else too. And then the other important message is to be your own advocate. Um, we have to ask questions. Um, if a doctor doesn't have time to sit with you, try to ask for time at a later time um, to have a, a lo longer conversation and uh, seek the resources that you need, but make sure that your needs are being met, your answers, your questions are being answered, and that you're being heard. It's so important for us to advocate for ourselves. So I'd like to close by thanking you all for um, being with us today. These are some photos from our chapter meetings. Um, I'd like to particularly acknowledge um, Congresswoman Clark, who will be speaking because she has really been a bedrock of our advocacy efforts. I'd like to thank Delta Sigma Theta Queens, who has been an awesome partner. Um, we had to postpone this event last year when the pandemic started. And uh, it was really um, wonderful to be able to uh, host it now, this year. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Angela and Michelle from the Health Task Force um, of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority in Queens. Um, they really have a focus on advocacy and health and um, developing creative events to engage everyone. And uh, I applaud them for their efforts and just think that um, they have bought, brought, you know, uh, wonderful perspectives to this event and uh, we have enjoyed working with them and we appreciate them. I'd also like to thank, thank Dr. Kim and Dr. McConnell and the Columbia Physicians team who have also been a fantastic partner um, to the Fibroid Foundation and uh, I hope that you will really that the words that they bring today will resonate with you, that they'll be helpful. Um, please know that we're always here as an organization. We're at fibroidfoundation.org. You can reach us um, at our website and on our social media platforms. We look forward to interfacing with you there. We are hosting a lot of um, in hopefully interesting programming uh, for 2021, the Ask Her campaign to engage everyone in the community. And we are looking forward to uh, walking with you through your fibroid journey. So thank you all. Um, enjoy Women's Wellness 2021. And I look forward to uh, interfacing with you all, hopefully in the future in person. Thank you so much for being here today. Bye. Greetings again, and thank you so much for that wonderful explanation of the Fibroid Foundation. At this time, we would like to bring Ms. Charmaine Jenkins to introduce our next portion of the program. There. I'm just always so inspired by dynamic women such as Soteria, who see an issue and decide to do something about it. Her diligence and commitment are commendable and are to be applauded. And I don't know if I'm breaking the rules, but if you can uh, clap in the chat for her, that would be great because this is amazing work. 14 years, 25 chapters, mm -hmm. all of these members, all of the work, legislation, it's amazing. And so let, let's move on with the program, but I had to say that. Um, so Congresswoman Yvette Clark, what can we say about her? She hails from central Brooklyn, the Congresswoman Di uh, Yvette Diane Clark represents the 9th Congressional District of New York and has dedicated herself to continuing the legacy of excellence established by the late 
Honorable Soror Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman and Caribbean American elected to Congress. Congresswoman Clark champions many issues that directly affect our communities, among them the Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act bill that Sateria just talked about. She has sponsored it in March 2020, and this bill will provide extended education and dissemination of uh, information on fibroids. And if all of her accomplishments and the many great strides she's made for us weren't enough, the icing on the cake is that she too is a member of our illustrious sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So good afternoon, Soror, Congresswoman Clark. Good afternoon, Soror, and thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction to the members uh, and leadership of the Queens Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, to the leadership of the Fibroid Foundation, to Sora Santeria, and to everyone who is joined, has joined us today. A pleasant good afternoon. It is my pleasure, it's my honor to be with you. As has been stated, I am Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, and I proudly represent New York's 9th Congressional District, that's Central and South Brooklyn. Well, Soros, it, it hasn't always been easy, but for a long time, it was much harder than it needed to be. You know, from the first day that I climbed the stairs of uh, the U.S. Capitol to uh, a, a couple of years right after that, I actually suffered from uterine fibroids. For those who don't know, uterine fibroids are non-cancerous growths in, on the uterus. They are one of the country's most common gynecological conditions, and they are very painful. About 26 million women and girls in the United States between the ages of 15 and 50 have uterine fibroids. About 15 million of them have very severe symptoms. Of the 26 million, no group suffers more from fibroids than Black women. Black women are twice as likely to develop fibroids than Hispanic women, and up to four times as likely than white women. Worse, they get them at a younger age deal with more and longer tumors, excuse me, and larger tumors, and experience harsher symptoms. Any year, fibroids can cost our healthcare system up to $35 billion a year. In any year like 2019, fibroid research can only expect around $70 million in the NIH funding, the National Institutes of Health. 26 million victims, yet fibroids remain in the bottom 50 of the 292 funded conditions. Few diseases exist in America that are so radically underfunded compared to the burden and pain that they inflict. And that is why I am so proud, Soros, that yesterday I reintroduced HR 2007, the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act of 2021. This bill will be transformational. It's named for my late dear friend and colleague and former colleague, Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who I might add was also a Sora, and who fought tirelessly to bring the critical attention and funding to this issue that it truly deserves. She first introduced this bill in 2001, 20 years ago. But this problem still exists today. With my legislation, we're going to change that. We're going to establish a new research funding through the National Institutes of Health at $150 million over five years. 
We're going to expand a CMS database on chronic conditions to include information on services provided to women and girls with fibroids. We're going to create a public education program through the CDC. And we're going to direct the Health Resources and Services Administration to develop and disseminate fibroid information to healthcare providers. So many suffer from fibroids because they don't recognize their symptoms. So many turn to hysterectomies, the only cure we know of since we've hardly tried to research others. The health and safety of 26 million women and girls is on the line and we can't let them down. So I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to join you today. The caucus, um, Black Women and Girls in the House of Representatives has taken on uh, this issue. We wanna build momentum for a national movement to make sure that my legislation becomes law. And it's possible with your advocacy, your help, sharing your stories so that we all don't suffer in our silence and in our silos, but we get the well-deserved research and support that we need to finally address what so many women over so many generations have had to bear. So to each and every one, please stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay blessed. And in this pandemic, as we move through it, we wanna encourage uh, that everyone seek out their healthcare, that you be vaccinated when your time comes, and that you continue to wear your mask. Many blessings, Soros. Thank you for having me. Hi, Congresswoman Clark, how are you? I'm doing well. Sora, it's so good to be here with you today. And let me just thank you for your passionate advocacy on behalf of Black women across this nation, on behalf of women who have suffered with uterine fibroids. Thank you so much. And I cannot thank you enough for your support. You really have anchored the cause of having legislation that matches the community that you touched on. Because when 26 million people are affected, then we really need the research funding to match that. So I'm so grateful. We are so grateful for all that you have done and your consistent and dedicated um, efforts toward making sure that fibroids remains a topic of discussion and attention. Um, Absolutely, I wanted to start... and it just dawned on me that, you know, I didn't add that, you know, the, the, the radical change in our quality of life as we suffer with fibroids costs so much, not only to us, but our loss of livelihood, um, you know, the, the, the deterioration, of our well-being, um, the economy suffers because we have not, as a nation, uh, placed the importance of research into uterine fibroids um, into the body politic. And so what you're doing to lift up this issue um, and, and to get uh, many more women informed, engaged, uh, many of our allies, whether they be male, female, who may not suffer with this condition, but understand how it impacts families, uh, individuals, communities. Uh, this is something to be lauded. And so let me just thank you for your leadership. That touches my heart. Thank you so much. And your team has just been amazing at working with us, with um, trying to find creative ways to make sure that everyone is in this conversation. So we appreciate you so greatly. And I know that you touched on um, the history of this bill, but um, would you um, expand a little on the work that you previously did with your dear friend, the Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, because you have been really working toward women's health issues for quite some time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Stephanie was a mentor of mine when I first came to Congress. 
And I look to her uh, to really uh, model uh, what it means to focus in, to center uh, the, the, the lives of Black women to a large extent. Because you know there were very few uh, Black women in the Congress uh, when I first entered. As a matter of fact, I was the only Black woman elected in a very large class of um, new members to the Congress. As a matter of fact, it was my class that first made uh, Nancy Pelosi the Speaker of the House. And, and, and Stephanie understood that our voices were essential because if we didn't speak up, there would be no one to speak on behalf of the issues, the healthcare, the needs of Black women and Black families. And so from, from her, um, you know, I decided, given my own lived experience, particularly coming to Congress with uterine fibroids, having to take time off from my work in my very first year in Congress to deal with my condition, that, you know, it was important that I raise up the, as we see, millions of women who suffer with this condition. And Stephanie had already set the ball rolling. Congresswoman uh, Tubbs Jones uh, was, was a forceful advocate. And, you know, when she uh, passed away, uh, I decided that this would continue to be a part of her legacy, that I would take up the banner, having lived through um, the, uh, a fibroid, uh, uterine fibroid experience, that it was important for me to speak for other women because I knew personally what it can do in terms of uh, your family life, your, 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 your work life, um, your interactions with people, um, all of uh, the baggage, if you will, that comes with uh, having uterine fibroids, heavy bleeding, and having to, you know, make sure you know where all the restrooms are and uh, just how we had to accommodate this in our lives. Um, I thought it was important. And ever since then, I've been working with my staff to advance uh, this legislation. Uh, we at one point had uh, our now vice president, but then Senator Kamala Harris as our co-sponsor in the Senate. Uh, we are currently speaking to a number of uh, colleagues on the Senate side so that we will have, a, once again, a Senate sponsor of this legislation. And my goal is, is to pass it in this session of Congress. So you, with the work that you're doing to heighten awareness, to educate and inform, to get our medical community to be engaged with us around this is, is so critical, is we know that it's going to take culturally competent uh, medical professionals to really uh, address this disease, um, to, to, to really uh, uh, address uh, the way in which, unfortunately, uh, Black women are treated um, uh, when uh, they are diagnosed with uterine fibroids and the options that are presented to them at varying stages of their lives around uh, how to address the uterine fibroids that they that they carry um, is something that we we really need to come together around. And I think you know the work that this bill will 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 supercharge the funding that it will provide to the NIH and the CMS will make all the difference in the world. And having the CDC on our side uh, will educate, will make sure that young girls who know something's not quite right, but don't know how to express it, will see in the public education campaigns the symptoms that they are experiencing and then seek out culturally competent healthcare uh, to address it. You shared so much in that response that I'd like to highlight. So I hope that everyone will bear with me, but you talked about your own experience and a lot of the outreach that we receive um, is from women who feel like they're alone. And I think that when you have um, someone like you, one of our, our dear representatives in Congress, sharing your story, um, it lets us all know 
that you all know someone who is walking through life suffering with uterine fibroids and that um, there's, you know, women are so strong um, and, and we carry about our daily lives, our um, careers and our family lives sometimes while in intense pain. And I think that it's important to further communicate that we hear you, we know that you're there and you absolutely are not alone in this. And um, I just really appreciate you for, for sharing that and for sharing the story of Congresswoman Tubbs Jones, uh, because you know we all um, build upon the shoulders of, of, of those who um, have existed in um, the public spectrum before us. And uh, we're so grateful for that leadership. And I also want to just highlight that all of our listeners, um, after we have this event and raise our voices and send letter, letters to, to Congress, um, there will be much Senate support to accompany our, our, our dear Congresswoman in this effort, because we need all of you um, to, to see this through, because I, I know that we can do this. And so Congresswoman Clark, can you share with our listeners um, how uh, each individual person can help to um, see this bill passed into law? Absolutely. Well. First of all, you know, we can't underestimate the power of social media. And I think it's so important that we share our stories, that we create communities of interest, and then that we encourage them, provide them with the information they need to reach out to their members of Congress, to reach out to uh, their senators, and let them know that this is a priority for them. This is not a heavy lift by any means. I serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has the jurisdiction for healthcare in our nation. And I think that, you know, that no one knows uh, our lived experiences better than we do. And, and, and in sharing our stories and creating those communities of interest, whether they're allies and individuals who never suffered from this condition, but care about you personally, and or they are uh, women who have navigated a, a life uh, with uterine fibroids. It's important that we build the momentum, that we you know get other folks to, to, to just stand with us. And we make calls, send emails, send letters, uh, so that our representatives know that this is a priority and that at, at any available moment to make sure that we get this legislation signed into law that provides the resources, the research, the public information, the public education, it is critical um, and we can do this. We can do this. I've seen how when we uh, get our mindset, uh, we are able to accomplish uh, a change in, in conditions just by virtue of acting. And, and I've seen it in Washington uh, during my time. I know that it's possible. So I wanna enlist each and every one of you who are viewing us today to speak to someone, get someone on board, create that space, whether it's on your Facebook page, through your Twitter feed, on your Instagram, whatever means that you're using during this pandemic to connect with others to utilize that so that we can see this done in the 117th session of the Congress of the United States. I love all of that feedback. And I also love as I read the bill and I was gonna ask you, you know, you shared that with us. So we have that HR 2007. Um, so we will add that to our letter um, templates that we send out. And I, I was really just, really blown away and so pleased to see how detailed you were with the bill language and how it is um there are areas for fibroid research and support on all levels state federal can you just talk a little bit about your vision for that in terms of um how all of our levels of government from local to federal can have a a, a, a part, they can play a part 
in in having women feel better and feel healthier and not suffer and have a better quality of life. Absolutely. Well, we know that you know will there be a a a federal law that then empowers our states and municipalities who really you know touch our communities where we live and they have to do a role they have to uh, play a role in this because uh the research will be administered the the funding will be administered the approach to uh quality health care will be administered at the very local level and so it's important that we establish as, as uh, President Biden likes to say a whole of government approach to uh, dealing with the health care of, of our women. I mean it, 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 this is I think a window of opportunity unfortunately it comes in the form of a pandemic where we are all very conscious of our health status. We're being tested right now for COVID on a regular basis. We're being encouraged uh, you know, to, to, to look at our nutrition. We need that research to, to determine, to a large extent, how uterine fibroids are, are formed. Uh, we need to look at the latest research into the genome about, you know, what kind of genetic uh, material is involved and how we can probably maybe uh, mitigate uh, the growth of, of, of fibroids um, utilizing scientific advances. None of that gets done when we are not funded to do that type of work. Additionally, we need our local public health and municipal health care infrastructures to be able to identify very early on this condition in young girls and young women. Because the longer that this goes undiagnosed, the more suffering takes place, the more uh, of our planning and execution on how we live our lives, uh, whether it's to go off to college, whether it's you know to take on that new job, will impact us uh, because ultimately it, it, there is no solution other than a medical solution right now. And so we want to make sure that uh, at every level there is a partnership and a commitment to working with our women in our community to take uh, control, to be empowered, to deal with this condition head on as early as it, we can find it and diagnose it so that the long-term challenges that so many like myself face in carrying uterine fibroids will not be the fate of those who are coming behind us. I'm sure that our um, presenters from Columbia Medical Center are applauding um, everything that you just said because early diagnosis and, and support locally from your local care provider is so incredibly important. And uh, here at the Fibroid Foundation, we are looking forward to supporting you 150% in all of your efforts. Um, you always multitask. I always think about all the different things umbrellas and, and hats that you wear. And uh, I just think that the work that you do is amazing. Um, we all appreciate you advocating for us and your dedication to service. And uh, we're looking forward to supporting you in whatever way we can to get this bill across the finish line, um, to encourage everyone to participate in the conversation through the Ask Her campaign. And uh, we hope that you have a beautiful rest of your day and we wish you well. And we thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Congresswoman thank Clark. Thank you, Santeria and, and, and Santeria. And thank you to all of my SORs at the Queens Alumni Chapter. Thank you to the Fibroid Foundation. You know, life is not compartmentalized, it is intersectional. And a lot of the work that we do um, is reflective of our lived experiences um, and how we can be of service to others. And so through our lived experiences, we become uh, uh, animated and we are, are bringing truth to uh, the work that we do 
and the work that we do on behalf of others. So let me thank you again. Thank my Soros and thank uh, everyone who is lifting up HR 2007 to make it a reality and to turn it into law. I'm speaking it into being because I know if anyone can make sure that this happens, it's the women of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and we are in your corner. Thanks everybody. Hello again. Now we will hear a presentation from Dr. Jeannie Kim. Dr. Kim is an assistant clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Columbia University School of Medicine. Dr. Kim is a friend to the Fibroid Foundation. She presented at Fibroid Talk New York City 2018. And uh, you're going to love what she has to say and it's really going to hopefully help many, many people. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jeannie Kim. I am um, a gynecologic surgeon at Columbia University Medical Center at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, I'm in the surgical division uh, it, within OBGYN and my clinical interests uh, are in fibroids and endometriosis, both of which make up the bulk of my practice. Um, I direct the Fibroid Center uh, along with Dr. Rachel McConnell, who you'll hear from later today, our fertility specialist. And I wanted to first thank uh, Delta Sigma Theta, the leadership and uh, its members, along with the Fiber Foundation and Soteria, our fearless leader, uh, for giving us the opportunity today to speak with you. Um, and I'll be speaking about optimizing uterine fiber treatment, the right treatment at the right time in a life course. Uh, so with this title, I really wanted to emphasize the importance of working with your physician to have a targeted approach uh, to therapy and individualizing uh, your treatment plan since not two people uh, are alike in terms of the symptoms and also life goals and health goals. Um, we are all gathered here today uh, because we have this common goal of improving women's wellness and health. And I'm positive that um, some of us in the room have either personally uh, suffered from fibroids or at least know someone uh, close who have suffered from fibroids. So I think this is an important topic to discuss. And I'm so um, thrilled to hear that there is definitely more national awareness uh, about this um, condition that um, is very important uh, for women. So um, I know a lot of you already know a lot about fibroids, but I just wanted to take the next 20 minutes to discuss um, op optimal fibroid treatment and some novel therapeutics as well, and uh, how we, we can target these therapies to the individual patient. So here are my disclosures. And, um, you know, I think we've been in this um, situation a lot where if we have a medical condition, we're not sure what um, to do next. Lots of choices, it's overwhelming. What do we do first? We go to Google <laughs> and we read a lot, tons online. Some of it may be true, some of it may be false. And we may join some uh, online support groups, maybe Zoom some friends now that it's the pandemic to see what they've done and what's worked for them in the past and what advice they may have for you. So let's start with definitions first. Um, and what are fibroids? Uh, fibroids are benign or non-cancerous tumors that arise from the overgrowth of smooth muscle in the uterus. Another common name is lyomyoma, and it's the most common pelvic tumor in women, uh, greater than 200,000 cases per year in the US alone. So the pathophysiology of uh, fibroids is somewhat poorly understood and it's extremely complex. And it generally starts from a stem cell and it's thought to um, have various factors from uh, hormonal factors like estrogen and progesterone, environmental factors, biological mediators, growth factors, and somehow there's proliferation of these smooth muscle cells that turns into a fibroid. And who gets fibroids? So unfortunately, it is uh, possible for any woman in their childbearing years to uh, get fibroids as it is responsive to hormones like estrogen and progesterone that are um, 
made from your ovaries. And although we know a lot about fibroids, the exact causes, uh, like I said, are not well understood, but there seems to be certainly a family history component to it in addition to some genetic predisposition. So um, as you can see in uh, large studies, population studies, you can see that black women are affected three times more than Hispanic, white, or Asian women. And in black and white women here, you can see that um, the incidence, so 80% uh, greater than 80% of black women uh, can have fibroids diagnosed uh, by the age of 50. So that's, that's a, a big number. And what are some common symptoms? Uh, abnormal uterine bleeding is probably the most common. So uh, the definition is heavy menstrual bleeding or uh, prolonged bleeding greater than eight days or bleeding that happens in between your menstrual cycles. So heavy menstrual bleeding is defined by the International Federation of OBGYN as, quote, excessive menstrual blood loss, which interferes with a woman's physical, social, emotional, and or material quality of life. So what this means is if it's heavy to you, it is heavy. Um, there are some scientific terminology uh, definitions like greater than 80 milliliters per menstrual cycle, which is extremely difficult to capture because then we'd have to, you know, collect all your pads and uh, tampons and weigh it. And it just doesn't make any clinical sense. Um, there's a PBAC score that you can also find online if you're not entirely sure whether yours um, is heavy or not. There, it's a, As you can see here in the bottom, uh, it's a scoring system where um, greater than 150 uh, is considered heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, in addition to bleeding, there can be pain issues, uh, painful menses or pain with intercourse, volume related symptoms like pelvic pressure, bloating, uh, other uh, organ compression like urinary frequency, sometimes difficulty emptying the bladder, Constipation is also another um, common um, uh, symptom, but as you can see, it's sort of, sort of um, a bit uh, vague. And infertility or obstetric complications can also occur. The location is extremely important to discuss because this can also impact what type of therapy you might need. So broadly speaking, there are three types. So subserosal is on the external surface of the uterus. Intramural is within the muscular wall and submucosal is inside the uterine cavity. And here you can see, this is the cavity, that's the lining that builds and sheds with each menstrual cycle where where pregnancy occurs. So how do we diagnose fibroids? It's important to go to your annual pelvic exam um, because your provider can certainly feel a larger mass or based on your symptoms, they can decide whether um, there is suspicion for fibroids. So the most common imaging is the transvaginal pelvic ultrasound or sonogram. In addition to that, there may be other imaging studies that you may encounter, such as a pelvic MRI or a saline infusion sonogram or commonly sonohistogram. They all kind of start to start sound the same. Uh, this is to see if the fibroid has uh, a component in the uterine cavity. Hysterosalpingogram typically is to check for the tubes to see if they're open, separate from the fibroids, but it can also detect uh, intracavitary um, masses. And also office hysteroscopy is another a way to see fibroids in the cavity. Other tests that you might encounter include an endometrial biopsy. So for um, women greater than age 45 with abnormal uterine bleeding, it's uh, typically recommended by the American College of OBGYN. It could also be earlier with some risk factors. Pap smear if you have abnormal bleeding, just to make sure it's not a cervix issue. Blood work to just check for anemia, make sure that is addressed. Uh, and we, as we discussed, ultrasound MRI, um, especially if we're considering surgical therapy, MRI is usually uh, ordered to evaluate for other uh, conditions such as adenomyosis, um, which can complicate your treatment. Um, I would say that Lyme sarcoma or cancer of the fibroid is exceedingly rare, but it's not zero. So it's also, uh, although the MRI is not definitive, it can sort of help guide us in terms of um, surgical therapy. So who needs treatment? So bothersome symptoms like the ones that we've discussed, or if there are any fertility concerns, infertility or suspected fertility difficulty, or if you've had past obstetric complications where the fibroid had grown and there was a lot of pain issues and you're looking to get pregnant again, then you may wanna uh, address the issue of fibroids before you get pregnant again. 
So treatment options, there's, there's a lot, um, and it can be a little bit uh, confusing. And we can just break this down into generally four buckets. So expected management is what we uh, providers, um, it's a fancy word for really doing not much, but just watchful waiting. Uh, there's medical treatment uh, options include, um, include uh, medications that we'll discuss in a different slide. Uh, interventional radiology colleagues can do uterine artery embolization and MR guided focused ultrasound. And also surgical treatment includes myomectomy, which is removal of fibroids, hysterectomy, which is uh, the removal of the uterus, not the ovaries. And then radiofrequency fiber ablation is um, a cauterization of the fiber itself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So how do we decide on what type of treatment? I think the easiest way to sort of think about this is what is your desire to maintain fertility? I don't want to simplify it that much, but that is a very important factor. So if you are desiring to maintain fertility, maybe you're not trying right now, um, you could either consider expectant management, watchful waiting, or medications to help alleviate some of your symptoms of bleeding, painful periods, and consider myomectomy for um, surgical removal of fibroids if you're actually con considering uh, getting pregnant at, at the moment or pretty soon. If you're done with childbearing, it does open up a couple of other options, including hysterectomy, uterine artery embolization, MR-guided focused ultrasound, radiofrequency fiber ablation, and uh, endometrial ablation, possibly for abnormal bleeding. So um, medical treatment options, it's important to note that it targets symptoms, so symptoms of abnormal bleeding, cramps, and it's generally, with the exception of maybe one or two, generally not for volume-related issues. So there isn't significant shrinkage from medications. It's a busy slide here, but I just want to point out um, that there are different categories of medication. And really, um, it depends on your medical health, medical issues, um, frequency, whether you can tolerate some of the side effects. And it's not that one is superior to the other, but it's just given differently um, and so just broadly speaking, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, can help with cramps and also decrease bleeding. The, in the blue or highlighted are the hormonal uh, components. Um, so the you know, easy ones are the birth control pills. Uh, that's a combination of estrogen and progesterone. It can also come in different formulation as in a ring or a patch. Uh, progestin only options also come in a pill form, an IUD form, an injectable form, a subdermal implant. And then there's the GNRH analogs where uh, Lupron is an injection, uh, Elagolix is an oral pill. They're meant for uh, heavy bleeding uh, for uh, fibroid. Antifibrinolytic therapy, you may have heard of Listata or Chenoxamic acid or Amicar. It's really to, it works on the clotting pathway, so it decreases overall bleeding, uh, but doesn't really address the pain component. And there's some other medical treatment options coming down the pipeline in clinical trials, some more successful than others, which are on hold for other sort of side effects uh, and concerns. Um, Pre-op considerations, even if you're not considering surgical therapy, I think it's very important to assess for anemia if you have had heavy bleeding. So uh, blood count, iron studies, and therapies would include um, either the medications that I discussed uh, before to uh, decrease the amount of bleeding that you have. I, and I sort of think about the, you know, you can think about um, your blood count as a bathtub full of water. So there's the monthly loss, that's the drain. So you kind of want to plug that. So that's where the medical therapies come in. So you don't lose that much blood. And then you do want to fill the tank with with water or blood, and that would either be with oral or IV iron infusion. And sometimes we work with hematology um, to get the iron, IV iron uh, infusions. Um, in the operating room, we do uh, sometimes request the cell saver system, which is collecting your own blood to be able to give it back to you. Uh, but it's also important to note that, especially with myomectomy and open surgery, that there can be a slightly higher risk of um, blood loss. So it's important to discuss just the possibility of a blood transfusion only in an emergency. So um, what type of surgical treatment um, is considered? So if you really are considering maintaining fertility, then 
although there are case reports of pregnancy with the other ones in the right column, truly the one that is probably the best would be fiber removal, which is myomectomy. And there are different ways of approaching myomectomy. Uh, there's the laparoscopic or robot assisted laparoscopy. So that's the minimally invasive procedure with the camera through keyhole, small incisions. And then there's the open approach, which is either a side to side or up and down incision, um, kind of like your C-section scar. And that is um, sometimes needed for patients who have multiple fibroids or it's too large, um, et cetera. Hysteroscopy, hysteroscopic myomectomy that's going in vaginally. Uh, and using a device to sort of shave off the fiber that's in the cavity is really meant for intracavitary fibroids. And then uh, this is not a common thing, but sometimes the fiber can actually prolapse out of the cervix uh, and into the vaginal canal. And if it's approachable, um, that's removed vaginally. And the laparoscopic or robotic approach is really touted as the minimally invasive uh, approach. And as you can see here, um, the, there's the different incisions, but more importantly, there's the benefits of this minimally invasive approach with faster recovery, less post-op pain, uh, less pain medicine is required. And especially in this day and age of the pandemic, it's really important to sort of minimize how much um, time you spend in the hospital. So if you're able to go home the same day, which is the case with the robotic uh, and laparoscopic procedures, that would be preferred uh, for uh, your overall health. Decreased scarring and smaller incisions and uh, decreased complication rate are also um, added bonuses. Um, this is just, uh, uh, you know, robot assist laparoscopy. I wanna just say is a form of laparoscopy and it, there may be some additional benefits with 3D visualization and endorissed instruments. So it just makes, um, you know, certain suturing and complicated pathology um, just a bit uh, more feasible. These are statistics uh, at Columbia, and as you can see here, um, greater than 75% of our patients undergo a minimally invasive procedure, and 96%, um, a huge uh, amount of patients, are able to go home on the same day uh, of the surgery for robotic myomectomy. Just inserted the slide just to point out that Dr. McConnell will be covering a lot of the fertility aspects of the discussion. But all I will say is that the location is critical in terms of um, offering treatment and also what approach to treatment. So submucosal fibroids, that's the intracavitary ones, or fibroids that are perhaps even in the muscular wall that may push into the cavity are uh, the types of fibroids that seem to um, decrease uh, uh, um, sort of implantation rates and increased risk of miscarriage. So fertility uh, is certainly improved uh, once the, these types of fibers are addressed. The external ones don't seem to be a, an issue. The intramural ones, this is the gray zone again. Um, and that's where you know we would sort of have a discussion about what would be required. Just a slide about pregnancy outcomes. So there's ample data about pregnancy following myomectomy and including minimally invasive myomectomy as well. After this type of surgery with any type of myomectomy, to, uh, typically the recommendation is to wait three to six months to let the uterus heal. You might feel great in two weeks, but the uterus just needs to heal to decrease the risk of uterine rupture, which is uh, that old incision um, sort of separating, but it's a, it's a very small risk, um, but that's why sometimes uh, C-section is recommended and this wait period before you conceive. I wanna just point out that as long as you have a uterus and you're premenopausal, fibroids can recur. And as you can see, it's sort of a, a higher number, 50 to 80%, but it's not the same as reoperation rate. And um, it just, it doesn't mean that you have to do something about it. And as you can see, the reoperation rate is low, um, but just to note that um, recurrence can occur. And pregnancy can be somewhat complicated by fibroids, not all the time, but there could be a higher association of C-section rates or bleeding at the time of delivery. Certainly pain during uh, pregnancy can be a possibility, but the data is somewhat inconsistent uh, for some of these other obstetric measures. So if you're not trying to get pregnant, you're done with childbearing, then it opens up some other options. Um, and hysterectomy is uh, touted as the definitive surgical therapy. 
Um, this is because as long as you have a uterus, like I said, um, you can have fibroid recurrence as long as you're premenopausal. Uh, but I wanted to just point out that hysterectomy, you know, I think there's some terminology uh, confusion. Um, hysterectomy is just removal of the uterus and sometimes the cervix which is the opening to the uterus. The ovaries, as long as they look normal, they would stay in place. So hysterectomy does not mean ovary removal. So you will not necessarily go into menopause uh, from a hysterectomy from this type of surgery. And if you are considering hysterectomy, myomectomy, the minimally invasive route with the laparoscopic or robotic uh, approach is certainly preferred and that you should seek out um, providers who, who might be able to uh, offer this to you. Uh, because sometimes the training is not equal. So hysterectomy rates, also as you can see here, uh, the overwhelming majority of hysterectomies were performed minimally invasively with patients going home the same day. And uh, just word about the right radiofrequency fiber ablation. So there are two types, um, and this is where energy, heat energy is delivered directly to the fibroid. And this is a transcervical approach which means that it's through the, the vagina and through the cervix. And so the benefit is that it's incisionless and it's again, going home the same day as you can see pretty high satisfaction and, and symptom improvement rates. And the other uh, counterpart is the laparoscopic uh, radiofrequency ablation. Here, this is actual surgery with incisions in the uh, abdomen. And e either way, there's um, you know, size limits, uh, et cetera, and there are unclear fertility outcomes. So it's not necessarily meant for women who want to conceive. Again, uterine fiber embolization done by radiation, radiology colleagues, also another important piece um, where small beads are um, given, placed in a vein, and it blocks the blood supply to the uterus and the fibroid. And there can be some shrinkage, improvement of bleeding, but again, the body is a very, um, smart thing where uh, additional blood supply can be found and there can be uh, increased growth of the fibroids later on after a few years. So this is not as uh, popular MR guided focused ultrasound, only a, a handful of institutions uh, provide this service with some limited data. And endometrial ablation, I just included this, it's not meant for fibroids, it's for bleeding, abnormal bleeding, and it's just cauterizing the inside lining. So as long as your cavity is normal, this may be an option for abnormal bleeding. So just wanna conclude that fibroids are really one of the most common women's health conditions um, and treatments uh, are varied and it's very patient specific. So you really should talk to your doctor about um, just a targeted therapy. And there are many um, options, medical, surgical, procedural that we talked about. And certainly we need more research. Uh, newer therapies are coming down the pipeline. And you know, with the new bill, I think it's uh, very exciting that where there's increased awareness, more support funding for research and strategic in initiatives and uh, additional programs. Um, the uh, CRAFT, which is our fibroid center, is um, uh, multidisciplinary with GYN surgery, reproductive endocrinology, intervention radiology, and hematology. So you might see one or all of us, um, if you were um, to come see us. And I do want to just, um, you know, this is my work family and the surgical division, but I most want to thank you for your attention and um, I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dr. Rachel McConnell. Dr. McConnell is a reproductive endocrinologist and assistant professor at the Columbia University School of Medicine. Dr. McConnell, thanks for being with us. Hello, my name is Dr. Rachel McConnell. I am a reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist at Columbia University Fertility Center at Columbia University. I will speak on fibroids and infertility. Fibroids are extremely common. They're the most common benign tumors of the uterus. You probably have heard of terms myoma, fibromyoma, as well as lyomyoma. Uh, these terms are used interchangeably, uh, but they all mean the same thing, a fibroid. They're most common in women of African descent. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that for a Caucasian woman, 
she has a 70% chance of having fibroids in her lifetime compared to a woman of African descent, about 80% chance of developing a fibroid in her lifetime. The incident in reproductive age women, that's around 35 to 40, it's gonna be about 20 to 40%. The good thing about fibroids, they are benign uh, and they're not associated with any increased risk of uterine cancer. About five to 10% of patients who present to the infertility clinic will have fibroids. However, only about two to 3% of their fibroids will be a cause of their infertility. Now, what causes a fibroid? Uh, we know that it originates from a stem cell in the muscular tissue of the uh, uterus. It will divide repeatedly and eventually form an, a very firm, rubbery mass uh, in the uh, muscle of the uterus. To, ex to say exactly what causes it, no one really knows is idiopathic. Um, as far as an exact cause, there have been some studies to show that um, it may be a combination of things such as uh, alteration of uh, the genes in the chromosomes, as well as increased production of growth factors. And estrogen and progesterone for all women, we know that um, fibroids are stimulated by the growth of estrogen. Uh, estrogen progesterone is a normal production from the ovary that helps to develop the lining of the uterus each month. However, uh, more exposure to estrogen in some women will increase the risk of uh, developing fibroids. Risk factors, we know that they're very common in families. Uh, for first degree relatives, they have about a three times more uh, risk of developing fibroids. And of course, women of African descent or Caribbean women will develop fibroids at a three times higher rate than a Caucasian woman. Some women who may have asymptomatic fibroids in, um, during pregnancy may also experience an enlargement of fibroids. Uh, we do find that there is an increase in um, production of fibroids in women who've never had children. And we also see uh, increased um, risk between the ages of 35 and 45. Other factors, uh, early menarche, um, women who start their period at a very young age, increased exposure to estrogens, again, predisposing. Uh, there's been some studies to show that uh, dietary intake of lots of red meat may predispose for, uh, for fibroids. And epidemiological studies have shown uh, that there may be an association with low levels of vitamin D uh, being a, uh, playing a role with fibroid development as well. Also, we know that women who are obese, they have an increased production of estrogen and they tend to be at a higher risk of developing fibroids, as well as excessive use or intake of alcohol can cause uh, increased uh, fibroid um, <clears throat> uh, factors as well. Now, there are three different locations of fibroids. A submucosal fibroid, uh, which, let's see if I can get this pen to work here. Let's see here. So with, uh, let's do the highlighter. Uh, with the submucosal fibroids, these are fibroids that lie right beneath the endometrium, okay? Uh, they can protrude into the cavity and be like a pedunculated uh, appearance. Or you can see a fibroid that originates from the muscle, uh, which we would call an intramural fibroid, but it's protruding into the cavity. Um, this would be an uh, intramural with a submucosal uh, uh, component. A uh, true intramural fibroid does not distort the cavity, and it is the most common one. You can see here is a fibroid that's in the muscle. It's not protruding out of the uterus nor into the uterine cavity. Uh, whereas a subserosal fibroid lies just beneath the serosal layer here of the uh, uterus but it does not protrude into the cavity. Uh, that 
and many of these fibroids are the fibroids that some women may feel and when they're really enlarged because it causes bulging, uh, bulging from the uh, uterus. Now, how does a woman know that she has fibroids? Some women uh, may be um, may have some idea if they have issues with anemia or they have very, um, they may notice increased growth of their waistline or they may notice a bulge in their low part of the abdomen uh, could be a sign that we may be, they may have uh, a fibroid. Uh, when they go to the uh, GYN doctor on physical examination, uh, many times uh, you can actually palpate, you can feel a fibroid. It's a very irregular mass on the uterus. And this is typically confirmed uh, with uh, imaging, such as using a uh, pelvic ultrasound, uh, in some cases an MRI. In our, um, in our field of reproductive endocrinology uh, and infertility patients, we want to know if they have uh, patent fallopian tube. So we may do a test called a hysterosalpingogram or another test called a sonohistogram. And that may be the way that we find these on, you know, incidentally, such as here. Here's a hysterosalpingogram. This is performed usually by a uh, radiologist um, a few days after a woman's period is over. A speculum is placed in the vagina, just like when you have your gynecologic exams, but a cannula is placed in the opening of the cervix in contrast, dye is injected into the uterus on a, and under a fluoroscopy screen, you can see the contrast filling the uterine cavity. And you can see it's this nice triangular shape here indicating that this is a normal uterus. And this little um, stream-like um, configuration here is guess what? The fallopian tube. And you can see the dye spilling into the pelvis letting us know that the fallopian tubes are clear. Unlike this picture here, you see this big mass occupying a big portion of the uterine cavity. That is a fibroid. Um, the other test, the sonohistogram, very similar to the hysterosalpingogram, but a hysterosalpingogram is more to evaluate the fallopian tubes, and the sonohistogram is a more a refined way of looking for uh, more detailed issues with the uh, uterus. Here we just inject and stir water or what we call nor or normal saline. And you can see the fluid here. Here's the muscle of the uterus here. But you can see this mass sitting in the cavity. That will be a submucosal uterine fibroid sitting in that cavity. And for patients who are trying to achieve a pregnancy, those particular fibroids would have to be removed. Now, what is the mechanism for fibroids causing infertility? It could be one of two things. One could be the effect that it may have on fertilization. Uh, there may be interference with sperm and egg uh, transport due to distortion of the cervix. As you can see here, some fibroids may uh, develop from the uh, muscle of the uterus but protrude into the end of cervical canal and also uh, fibroids such as here that's blocking the fallopian tube. So those locations can impact um, uh, fertility and may be a mechanism for uh, that pa uh, patient causing uh, a cause of infertility. The other mechanism will be related to implantation failure due to disruption of the vascular church of the endometrium or alteration of the endometrial contour. So types of fibroids from our perspective as a, a fertility specialist, the most detrimental fibroid for us is the submucosal fibroid. So those fibroids need to be removed. Uh, intramural fibroid could have modest impact if it's causing distortion of the uterine cavity or if it's um, really a, a large fibroid like five to seven centimeters. Subserosal fibroid, remember that's the one that's involving um, the outer uh, portion of the uterus has the least impact on pregnancy rates. So the management for uh, fibroids uh, in an infertility patient is going to be in most cases expected management especially if a patient has, they're totally asymptomatic, they have fibroids, but they have no complaints of abnormal bleeding, no pain. Uh, we just see that they're there. 
And if they're small and they're not impacting the uterine cavity, we typically say, leave them alone. Whereas a patient with a submucosal fibroid or a very enlarged intramural fibroid distorting the cavity, surgery would be the treatment. Uh, medical treatment does not have a major role for um, fertility patients because our goal is to help the patient conceive pregnancy so it's more action uh, to get things going for the patient. The interventional therapist, which Dr. Le uh, Kim may have um, uh, discussed with you, um, like high, uh, like uterine arterial embolization or high frequency ultrasounds um, do not have a good role for patient uh, infertility patient. You would only want to use those um, for patients that think that they're no longer want to have a child, uh, but not for the infertile patient. However, there have been cases where patients have had these procedures in were able to conceive, but that is not the treatment of choice for infertility patient. So the treatment of choice surgically would either be a hysteroscopic myomectomy or a laparoscopic robotic assisted myomectomy, or in many cases where there are very large fibroids, an abdominal approach with an open myomectomy may be needed. Hysteroscopically, we use an uh, rigid hysteroscope where we can look directly into the uterine cavity and through different surgical ports, you can um, have access to the fibroid and be able to remove it. Hysteroscopically, this is typically what you would see. This is the top of the uterus here. And then this uh, area here would be the opening to the fallopian tube on the one side and the opening to the fallopian tube on the other side. And this is a good illustration of what a submucosal fibroid would look like. Uh, so is this one, but this one is showing one that has a highly vascular. So the management removal of all submucosal fibroids, regardless of the size, uh, removal of intramural fibroid if it's distorting the cavity, or consider it if it's five to seven centimeters or larger. There is no indication for removal of a subserosal fibroid. In many cases, um, Dr. Kim may see patients uh, that need surgery in their older women. Uh, and they may come to see me because we want to make sure that these women have a chance to create embryos before they have surgery because the surgery in many cases is going to take time for healing uh, so it's going to delay their process so we may offer them in vitro fertilization uh, prior to their surgery uh, in those cases IVF would involve us uh, having to stimulate the ovary to recruit eggs and then harvest them identify the egg, and in a petri dish, we do fertilization outside of the body, allow the development of the embryo, and when the time is appropriate, we do a embryo transfer. In order for this to occur, it means that we need to stimulate the ovaries with various medications, typically injectable fertility drugs to stimulate the production. Uh, then we use medications such as Ganarelix or Cetratide or Lupron to suppress ovulation before we're ready to retrieve because we won't, do not want the patient to ovulate prior to retrieval of the eggs. At the appropriate time when follicles are mature, then we will trigger ovulation. And when we're ready to prepare uh, for transfer, we will support the lining with progesterone either with vaginal uh, progesterone support or intramuscular injections. When a patient first start uh, IVF cycle, their ovaries are very quiet. This is a typical ovary and with a little black circle here are follicles. Those are the sacs that hold the eggs. After stimulation, typically you're going to see of the ovary be very enlarged with multiple follicles, hopefully one egg per follicle, uh, but never more than one egg. It's either empty or there's one egg per follicle. We use a transvaginal approach to retrieve the eggs. On the ultrasound guidance, uh, we have a needle attached to the vaginal probe. 
uh, we can see the needle going directly into the ovary. Uh, the fluid along with hopefully an egg is um, retrieved into a sterile test tube. This is then passed to the embryologist so that they can identify it microscopically if there is an egg in the fallopian tube, I mean in the, um, in the test tube. In the laboratory, what happens there after the egg is identified? We put it with so many thousands of sperm uh, and then allow fertilization to take place. 24 hours later, we will look on the microscope to see if we are dealing with a fertilized egg. And we know that by seeing um, what we call the 2PN stage, where there's a pronucleus from the egg and a pronucleus from the sperm. Uh, we then have to wait five to seven days, just like it normally takes place in the body, for this embryo to undergo cleavage, where it would divide and eventually develop into two different cells, uh, the inner cell mass, the cells that will become the baby, and what we call trifecta germ cells around the periphery, the cells that eventually would become the placenta. It's at this stage that we would either biopsy the trifecta germ cells where you could do pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, or you're ready to actually do a transfer. And on the ultrasound guidance, again, we are typically will place one, fert uh, one fertilized egg or two, depending upon the uh, age of the female, uh, as well as whether the patient underwent uh, pre-implantation genetic testing or not. Uh, and then hopefully pregnancy is a positive outcome for them. So I can tell you there's insufficient evidence that fibroids reduce the uh, that fibroids reduce the likelihood of pregnancy with or without treatment. There is also insufficient evidence to determine it, that a specific fibroid size or number or location excluding submucosal fibroid will uh, reduce the likelihood of pregnancy. And there is no evidence that removal of a substerosal fibroid will improve fertility. There's fair evidence that hysteroscopic myomectomy for submucosal fibroids will definitely improve pregnancy rates. And there's fair evidence that a myomectomy does not impair reproductive outcome. Conclusion, fibroids are benign tumors. They're very common in reproductive age women. Uh, fibroids are the cause of infertility in a relatively small percentage of cases and medical therapy of fibroid is not an effective therapy for improving fertility. However, sur surgical treatments uh, are definitely indicated in some cases. Um, surgery for asymptomatic women with cavity distorting fibroids will improve pregnancy. Uh, and a myomectomy is also reasonable for patients who have fibroids that are preventing access for egg retrieval um, for patients undergoing IVF. Um, the type of fertility treatment for patient, it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I appreciate your time, and now I would take any questions. Thank you. Hello there, Dr. Kim and Dr. McConnell. How are you both? Doing great. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you for being here. Your presentations were very informative. I even, I, I learn a lot every time I hear you speak. So thank you so much. I'm sure you're helping a lot of our listeners today. So we got a lot of questions while you were talking. And I'm sure that um, you're, you're well, um, very capable and, and poised and well um, um, able to answer these wonderful questions. So I'll just jump right in if that's okay with you. Um, one of the questions we had, I know, Dr. Kim, you touched on recurrence of fibroids, and that's a big question. Um, and uh, the specific question was, if I have one surgery, will I need more? Will they recur? And I know for me, my, my fibroids recurred with under, in under a year after every surgery. So um, can you just um, expand, um, either one of you, to, um, feel free um, to just expand on 
do fibroids frequently recur and um, just some framing around that whole process? Sure. Um, so recurrence is um, pretty common. And uh, the American College of OBGYN, uh, in their data, it suggests that there's at least uh, a 20 percent chance that if you've had a myomectomy, that there is a 20 percent chance that you might need a recurrent, like a, another procedure. Um, but recurrence and reoperation are very different things. And so uh, even if you have a recurrence of fibroids, it may not affect you um, as much as the first time around maybe, or um, that it may, uh, you know, that you are able to do other medical treatment options or other therapies, and not necessarily do surgery. So I think in my, um, in my slide, I had a recurrence rate of up to 50 to 80%, um, but that reoperation was more like seven to 16% within eight years. That's very okay. helpful. Um, and Dr. McConnell, we have a question on implantation. Um, is implantation painful and how is the patient prepped for implantation? Very good question. And I'm happy to tell you implantation is not painful. When we do the actual egg retrieval, that can be very painful. So of course we have uh, a, a local anesthetic that's being used. When we actually do a transfer, there's no pain medications because there's no pain. There's no needles, it's just a very soft catheter, even to the point that we usually have the spouse in the room with the patient. That's good to know. Thank you for that. Okay, another question is, um, if you have fibroids, is surgery a must? <laughs> uh, well, I hope um, you got the takeaway from the presentation that uh, it's definitely not a must. Um, there's definitely just watchful waiting uh, in addition to uh, medications, and there's uh, different kinds of medications, whether it's hormonal, non-hormonal. But if you are, um, uh, if your symptoms have not been adequately addressed with those treatment options, or you're not a candidate for some of the medication options because either you're actively trying to get pregnant, um, and or you say to yourself, "I'm done with this." <laughs> then uh, I think you could consider other uh, procedures. And there's surgical therapy like myomectomy, hysterectomy, but there's also non-surgical radiologic uh, therapies as well, like the uterine artery embolization uh, that I discussed. Okay, that's helpful as well. Uh, Dr. McConnell, you mentioned UFE, uterine fibroid embolization, also sometimes called uterine artery embolization. and uh, there was a question that came in today, and we get questions very frequently about um, UFE as it relates to uh, those who would like to conceive, women who'd like to conceive. And um, I, I think there's also some fear um, that's expressed about myomectomy. Um, and I'm sure this is a, a theme that you hear quite often from your patients. Can you speak to um, considerations of fibroid removal when you want to um, conceive? And I know you touched on this, and I know that every case is very different, um, but just at a high level, um, would you mind speaking to those concerns about how to perhaps navigate the decision-making process with your doctor when you are actively trying to conceive? Sure. When you're actively trying to conceive, if the, if the patient, if you're asymptomatic, no symptoms, no abnormal bleeding, and it's just mm -hmm. incidental findings that there's fibroids there, the treatment is to do absolutely nothing and focus on the infertility because most likely the fibroids are not causing the infertility. So we focus on the, 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 uh, the cause of the infertility. Uh, in addition, you mentioned about uh, embolization. Uh, we do not recommend that for any patient that has a desire for future fertility. Uh, if the person is symptomatic, then unfortunately, uh, surgery would be the only option besides medication, okay? Uh, however, patients who've had immunization, some of those patients have been able to get pregnant, but knowing that you want to conceive in the future is not recommended. It's not the best choice. 
Thank you for that. Uh, another question we have that just came in, I'm going to maybe jump toward the end of our menstrual life for a second, um, I think is a great question. Um, are you, is it recommended to have regular annual exams and pap smears if you've had a hysterectomy? It's a good question, and I get that question a lot too. Um, so if you've had a hysterectomy, that means you had your uterus removed, uh, probably the cervix as well. Um, but it could mean that most of the time we have the ovaries left behind. And so the ovaries um, are also pelvic organs where problems can arise. Mm -hmm. In addition to other, um, uh, you know, part of that uh, well woman's visit is not just a pap smear necessarily, but it also includes the breast exam and just overall uh, uh, wellness of the woman. So I think maybe you're alluding to if you um, maybe perhaps if the cervix was removed at the time of the hysterectomy um, and if you've had all normal pap smears in the past, the, the test of a pap smear is to check for cervical cancer. And so if you've had all normal pap smears in the past, no HP, HPV issues, and you've had your cervix and the uterus removed, then, then you don't actually need a pap smear, but you still need your breast exams, you still have your ovaries, if you do still have your ovaries in place, you do still need uh, an annual exam from that standpoint. If you've had um, an abnormal pap smear, and I think uh, it's more like precancer cells of the cervix, CIN is what we call it, um, I think it's uh, generally recommended to continue testing after the cervix is removed because the HPV can actually exist in the vaginal wall uh, or the vulva as well. That's very helpful. So, you know, the takeaway from that is to just maintain your health, you know, always be very vigilant about your health. I think and, and at any age, I think it's good. And knowledge is power. Um, so that's a, a, a great that's great feedback, thank you. Um, we had a question about calcified fibroids and conceiving. Are there any considerations there that should be taken into account? The same thing, a calcified fibroid is to me a fibroid that has lost its blood supply. Uh, so it's not going to grow. Uh, and if a patient is totally asymptomatic again and it's not in a location that's interfering with implantation, then no, just observation of it is fine. Thank you. Um, the next question is about estrogen. And uh, we got a couple of questions on estrogen. Um, one person wanted to ask if there's a way to lower it, but then we have a question too on estrogen dominance and and any um, way to address that. And I do know that it's been reported that women of African descent have higher estrogen levels. And um, I just, I personally too, am curious um, about, you know, our bodies, as uh, you both alluded to, um, are, are very intelligent. And so, you know, the estrogen levels that we have, I'm sure are there for a reason, probably some of which we may not be aware, but. Are there any, is there any new data to um, specifically address estrogen dominance in women or, or any particular considerations there? That's a very interesting question. Um, I always think about patients who have, uh, we all have estrogen. Why some patients will develop fibroids and others will not with the same estrogen level, you know? Uh, so we know that estrogen is not the um, we can't say it's the cause of fibroids. It's definitely linked to hyperstimul um, uh, increased growth of fibroids and more fibroids to grow. So I don't think we can just pick on estrogen. There's so many other factors that are playing a role as well. Uh, however, uh, knowing that estrogen will stimulate the growth of fibroids, what can we do uh, to decrease estrogen production? Um, in African-American women, all women, things that we can do ourselves is make sure that we're doing dietary changes. Push away a lot of the butter. Push away all of the red meat, which I love. Uh, push away flour. Just think more of like a Mediterranean-type diet, you know, 
high fiber, leafy vegetables, those types of things. Those are things that we can control. Uh, other things that would be uh, progesterone. Progesterone is a hormone that's going to counter counteract estrogen production. Uh, so if a patient is not having regular periods, she's has an, a dominance of estrogen, especially patients who have what we call polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it would be very important for those patients to counterbalance, speak to their physicians, and make sure that progesterone is given to them uh, frequently to make sure that they have irregular periods so that they're counter-producing, counteracting the estrogen dominance. That is, thank you for that answer, Dr. McConnell. Um, you know, I, uh, I know that every patient is different. Um, I became a pescatarian between surgeries three and four because I wanted to see if it would, I was for trying to prevent surgery four. Um, and uh, rather than me having to have a surgery in about the three to four year window, it became seven years. Um, so I felt that I had some success in that effort. Um, and I know that's just one data point, but um, to your, to your um, point of explaining you know, all of those dynamics, um, I just wanted to share that. Uh, another question. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Ken. Yeah, it's just with, uh, with estrogen, um, you know, also, uh, obesity could also be a factor because the fat cells in the peripheral, um, there's some conversion of um, fat cells into estrogen. So certainly weight loss could be another lifestyle modification. And then, you know, not to point out the obvious, but when you do reach menopause, um, the estrogen levels go way down. So any sort of conditions, whether it's fibroids, you know, hopefully it, it it's sort of a should be a non-issue after that point. If there's continued growth of uh, a uterine mass after menopause, then we would really be worried about other things, more like cancerous types. That's helpful, great point. Um, are there any downsides to having a hysterectomy if you do not want to have children? Um, well, I think if you don't want to have children, um, the downside of hysterectomy, I think it's more maybe more like just risks of hysterectomy. Maybe that's a better way to frame the question. <clears throat> and so just even if you do, um, you know, it, so for hysterectomy in general, there's just general uh, risk, risks of a procedure. Uh, that includes, you know, bleeding, infection, any damage to nearby organs, uh, such as bowel, bladder, blood vessels, nerves, anything in the vicinity. Those are the common sort of surgical risks. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question. Is there a risk of prolapse with hysterectomy? It's a very good question. Um, so, you know, I think this is, um, it, I will point out that it's not necessarily the hysterectomy that causes the prolapse. Even if you don't have a hysterectomy, full women, you know, based on their body composition, um, whether or not they've had multiple uh, pregnancies, especially vaginal deliveries. And I think you're sort of born with a set of tissue. <laughs> and so they're, you know, kind of like a hernia, you know, of uh, not of the pelvis, but uh, a prolapse is sort of hernia of the pelvis. So even if you didn't have a hysterectomy, one can be at risk for prolapse. And prolapse is generally when uh, certain organs sort of, uh, you know, bulge out uh, vaginally, whether it's your pelvic organs or there could be intestine or bladder in there. Um, so I, I will say that um, you know, I think that's sort of the common maybe myth is that hysterectomy causes prolapse, but it's not necessarily that aspect of it. It's just as we age, as we, you know, have had more kids, vaginal deliveries, those are sort of more the risk factors for prolapse. That's interesting. Okay. Um, do, Dr. McConnell, do fibroids always grow during pregnancy? Uh, absolutely not. Um, Fibroids, just like when you're not pregnant, we uh, definitely will see um, in some cases fibroids may regress. However, some existing fibroids that are there during pregnancy may grow. Uh, a lot of patients don't even know they have fibroids. 
thoughts until they are diagnosed with preg being pregnant and it's an incidental finding. Um, and so subsequent to that, um, do fibroids always shrink at menopause? We got a couple of questions on that. I'm watching the questions are coming in steadily. So um, Emma, our social media manager is feeding them over to me on my phone. Uh, so there's lots of interest in, in what you're sharing today. Well, Dr. Kim can speak on that as well, but I will tell you because there is no estrogen production, fibroids should no longer grow. To say that they're going to shrink to the point of non-existence, I that's not going to occur. But they definitely should not grow any further, uh, and may may even have some shrinkage, but not disappearing. And that's what Dr. Kim was alluding to before. If a fibroid um, was noted to grow during pre, I mean during menopause, that would be a major concern because there's no estrogen production there. Okay. You would have to be concerned that there's other more ominous uh, issues going on, such as cancer. Mm -hmm. But I think you bring up a good point that I think the um, sometimes the excitation is, oh, I reach menopause. Oh, it should kind of go away. And I think that's yeah. the hope. Um, but unfortunately, there are times when the uterus stays exactly the same size um, or may shrink a little bit, but not to the point of significant you know, relief of symptoms. And so there are um, a few patients that I take care of who have tried to wait for menopause and give, you know, give that a chance to see if there's improvement of symptoms. And uh, if there isn't, then we discuss other options. Which um, this discussion on waiting till menopause and, and symptomatology of fibroid shrinking or not shrinking led me to another thought, which I think is really important for our listeners to know about, which is bulk symptoms. I think that um, many women are existing, experiencing bulk symptoms and not really equating that to the uterine fibroids. And so um, can you touch on um, what bulk symptoms are um, and uh, just anything that we should uh, kind of look out for? Yeah, so I think bulk symptoms um, certainly can be from fibroids, especially if you have large masses that are, you know, I've definitely seen patients where it comes up to the rib cage sometimes, um, and where you, uh, there's just not enough room for um, other organs to properly function. So um, I, on the contrary, bulk symptoms can be sort of a vague symptom, like abdominal distension could be from other organs as well. So I think you know, discussing with your provider um, and getting a physical exam, et cetera, just to make sure that, you know, not all bulkiness is, is equal. So just to get to the bottom of the, the cause of that. Helpful. Okay. Um, does IVF cause fibroids to grow? That was a question that we had. Very good question. Because <clears throat> with IVF, um, you are using hormones and hormones are what we call gonadotropins, and so they're stimulating production of estrogen. Uh, so a lot of patients who have fibroids, we are concerned, uh, but we also know, <clears throat> excuse me, that with limited exposure of hormones, uh, meaning if they went through a cycle of one to two cycles of IVF, I do not have a fear that all of a sudden their fibroids are going to really increase in size. You have to remember fibroids are slow brewing tumors, um, even with estrogen production, you know, uh, fibroids, what you described for yourself, having fibroids, you know, grow within a year, that's not the typical. Uh, some fibroids are more aggressive, uh, but it's usually like over a two to three year window where you actually will start seeing fibroids, you know, slowly grow. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Is a DNC a treatment for uterine fibroids? So DNC stands for dilation of the cervix and curatage, which is just the inner scraping of the inside lining. So um, that, that means that we get tissue sampling. So it's to rule out other cancerous, precancerous cells uh, and empty, clean out the inside lining. So um, the answer is not 
really, but it can occur as part of your treatment plan, but it doesn't necessarily target the actual fibroid. I think that's important for everyone to hear. Um, so thank you for that. Um, another question we have is, um, is there a um, size or number of fibroids for which a laparoscopy is not applicable? And I know that's getting very specific um, and each case is different, but that was a question that we just received. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I wish I could say there was like a magic number that I can say, but it's really just the overall picture um, of the, the patient. Um, so, I think what you're alluding to is, yes, the more number of fibroids there are, it does limit um, the ability to do the procedure laparoscopically if we're talking about fibroid removal, myomectomy. Um, and that's just because of the sheer limit of, um, you know, of the, the technology. Um, so if there is many, many fibroids, then perhaps the incision is um, more recommended. But in terms of size, again, it's... Um, it's not that there is a cutoff, but it's just, or is there enough room for the instrumentation to, to go in laparoscopically? And if you're talking about removal of the uterus hysterectomy, then um, it's really not the number of fibroids, it's really the overall size of the uterus, but not just that, um, it's just the shape of it. Um, so not to get into too much detail, but if there's too much bulk sort of uh, in the lower aspect of the uterus where the blood supply is and it makes it challenging for us to look with the camera uh, and access that point, then sometimes we're not able to do things, uh, to do surgeries laparoscopically. But I think, you know, we sort of um, try very hard to do things through the minimally invasive route. That's very helpful. So for a follow-up myomectomy question, um, we've gotten this a couple of times. Are you limited in the number of pregnancies that you can have after a myomectomy? And are you limited um, to the method of delivery of your baby after myomectomy? So um, after myomectomy, it depends on, again, the location and how much of the uterine muscle wall was impacted. So. For example, if you had bulk symptoms mainly and your fibroid, let's say was 10 centimeters, but was all on the external surface of the uterus where we did not actually have to cut into the uterine wall, um, then your uterine wall has been maintained and to preserve its integrity. So a uh, vaginal delivery can be considered. I think that's probably the, the luckiest sort of situation. However, the overwhelming majority of times the fibroids are actually involves uh, the muscular wall and oftentimes the full thickness of it. So um, certainly if we, if you have um, intramuscular fibroids that impact the cavity and we do enter the uterine cavity and we repair that very carefully, um, then certainly you do need a C-section for delivery. But even if you have an intramural, so within the muscular wall, and we did not actually enter the uterine cavity, um, I think there's, you know, good evidence just with the uterine rupture rate, et cetera, that there is a consideration, uh, you know, a recommendation for a cesarean section. I don't know, Dr. McConnell probably have more to add. I agree, I agree with you. We pretty much, pretty much patients to go by um, whatever the surgeon says, because we look at um, the surgeon knowing exactly what went on in that procedure. Uh, and so typically uh, for us, a number of deliveries, uh, you know, some patients ask after I've had like three C-sections, can I get pregnant again? Uh, so I would think about that like with fibroids. You've had one injury, so to speak, to the uterus because you've had surgery on the uterus and now you have another procedure for doing a C-section. So I go with the old rule, the old school is that you know, three C-sections, you may want to stop. Uh, but, you know, nothing is absolute. So we have patients that uh, may want more children. So I typically will refer them to like a high-risk OB doctor uh, just to have that discussion, go over what the risk will be to them and the pregnancy. So I don't want to say that there's a magic number where we say no. I, I think everyone has to be individualized. 
This is such great information. So last two questions. Um, is there any data on natural ways to shrink fibroids? That you're aware of? Very good question. I get that quite a bit. Um, I don't know of anything natural. Uh, I know some people have tried acupuncture, so many different things, you know, and a lot of patients, uh, people, maybe even some physicians are not aware of this. Some fibroids will shrink and go away, very small fibroids, uh, but 33% of them are going to grow and 33% of them will stay the same. Uh, so I think if you are doing things to try to keep your body as healthy as possible, following up with your doctor, uh, maybe there are things we can do to try to prevent them from getting bigger. But of course, medication, most medication that you can use uh, to help shrink fibroids is more of an adjunct for surgery. Uh, because typically once you stop the medication, most of the fibroids will just grow back and maybe even grow back at a higher rate, uh, bigger size than when they were previous. That's, that's helpful as well. So last question, um, is there any link that you know of between hair relaxers and fibroids? This is a huge question, especially in the African-American community. Um, that sparked um, a, a, an enormous conversation years ago. I don't know of any link. Uh, have you, Dr. Kim? Uh, no. Not that I've heard of, no. no. I agree. Uh, I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just thinking of, um, just thinking of it from a scientific standpoint, you know, uh, what would be stimulating it? Uh, so I, I think, I don't think it's a relationship. You know, I can't think of hair relaxers increasing estrogen production or increasing anything that I'm aware of that would stimulate mm -hmm. the growth of fibroids. And, you know, we mentioned about growth factors and stuff like that. Uh, so I just, on a scientific level, I would say no. And I, I would just also like to add that I, I interviewed the physician who wrote that initial paper and uh, she also confirmed that there was no link between the two, that the data was inconclusive. So just wanted to take the time since everyone's here to share that information. And I'd like to just close by saying that um, for all of you listening, um, it's my hope for you that you have care providers who are as compassionate as Dr. Kim and Dr. McConnell. Um, you want someone who's going to answer your questions, um, work with you, hear you, um, and develop a, a treatment plan for you specifically. And, and Dr. Kim and Dr. McConnell, thank you so much for, for many things. One, uh, you kept us all safe last year when you gave us a heads up that it was probably not a good idea to have an in-person event with over 100 people at the start of the pandemic. So you kept um, the Delta Sigma Theta Queens alumni chapter team safe. You kept our team safe. And um, I've reflected on that many times over the past year and I'm eternally grateful. And, and you kept our, our, our um, attendees safe. Um, so thank you for that because um, I value our physician community. You lead us in the right directions and um, we value your partnership, and we are so grateful for your time with us today um, and for your insights, and um, we wish you well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for thank giving you. us the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Wow. <laughs> That was such great information and instructions on how to take care of ourselves. And I feel like we got an exclusive about that bill being reintroduced just yesterday too. So that's exciting news and we're amongst the first to hear it. Um, so I wanna thank the Fibroid Foundation. I wanna thank the Help Task Force and the chairs, Michelle Sohn and Angela Williams. I want to thank Congresswoman Clark, Dr. Jeannie Kim, Dr. Rachel McConnell. Um, I'm going to say our chairs of the Health Task Force again, Michelle Sohn and Angela Williams. In addition to all the great information 
you receive. We will now have two amazing breakout sessions. So it's not over yet. You can select from the Yoni steaming um, breakout room. That'll be, I think it's gonna be breakout room number one. A little technical difficulty there. That'll be breakout room number one with Isis Tom Thomas. And she's the founder of Divine Sacred Spaces, which focuses on women and womb wellness. She's a herbalist, birth and postpartum doula. She's a Yanni Steam practitioner, a Reiki healer, a yoga instructor, and a sound healer. Um, Yanni Steaming, also known as vaginal steaming, is an ancient old natural remedy used to cleanse the vagina and uterus. It helps regulate menstruation and ease period cramps and bloating. So that should be um, room number one. Room number two will be Carla Burns, and she's the Senior Healthy Living Science Analyst at the Environmental Working Group, EWG. And Carla specializes in toxics uh, research and has a background in ecotoxicology. And she'll provide information on beauty and personal care products to help you make informed decisions about what products to buy and use on your bodies and in your homes. So um, as a reminder, the options for both uh, breakout rooms will appear directly on the screen. You can pick one, but not both. If you have selected the wrong breakout room, just drop a note in the chat. It will help you move to the correct session. Um, also, the chat is for questions, just like it was here. So try to minimize personal exchanges. And before you click on your breakout session, we wanna remind you to please complete the survey, which is located in the chat. And as a thank you for attending, remember we have prizes for the first 19th, 51st and 70th person that registered and attended today. The prizes will be sent via email. Um, so make sure you um, provided your names and your names are uh, clear on your registration, which they should be. So select your desired breakout room to move to. Enjoy your session. We thank you all for coming. I hope it was as informative and impactful for you as it been for me. And so on behalf of the Health Task Force, I've been your host, Charmaine Jenkins, and thank you all for being here with us. Enjoy the breakout rooms.